Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this application support webinar for the Turing Scheme. Today, we will be focusing on the qualitative questions that form part of the application. My name is Lara Blagovic, and I'll be presenting today. And with me, I have Sean James and Simona Cavani, who will be monitoring the Q&A, and also Matilda Manley-Lewis, who is handling the technical side of the webinar. I'll just go through some housekeeping first of all. Um, you are all automatically on mute because we're using Teams Live today. If you'd like to ask a question, you'll see a chat icon over in the top right hand side of your screen, which you'll see circled on this slide. Clicking on that will open the Q&A feature where you can post questions as we go along. If you don't mind, it'd be helpful if you could include your name when you're submitting a question in case we need to follow up with you directly. To ask a question, click on Featured and then on the Ask a Question button. To see all questions that have been asked and the answers, just stay in the Featured section. The section called My Questions will show only the questions that you yourself have asked us. So we ran two webinars last week um, that covered the technical guidance on how to complete the application form, uh, focusing in on the budget sections for the activity in particular. If you missed these, uh, a YouTube video is now available. You'll find a link to that on the application resources part of the website. Um, today, we're only going to be focusing on the narrative questions, which we didn't cover in detail in last week's webinars. Before we look at those qualitative questions in depth, here is a reminder of the link to apply, which you'll also find on our Turing website. The deadline is Friday the 9th of April at midday, and the application form should be completed in full online. You'll need to register an account on the application portal before you can get started. All resources designed to help you with your application are published on the Turing Scheme website. Before starting your application, you should familiarise yourself with the Turing Scheme Programme Guide and also the application guidance. We also have an FAQs document that you may find useful to refer to. OK, so we'll move on now to look at those qualitative sections of the form. There are four main qualitative sections made up of multiple questions. These four sections, as you can see on the slide, are entitled Positive Impact, International Engagement, Design of Project Plan and Widening Participation. There are further two sections that require a narrative answer as well. And to each month of activity, you will need to write a narrative to explain your choice of activities. And you also need to write about your proposed uses for the organisational support budget. We'll focus on those first four main sections in detail. The first section is positive impact. This contains five separate questions, each with a 500 word limit. These are screenshots just to show you what the form looks like, but hopefully you've all been able to log in by now and take a look at the form. Just to, just to note on this slide that under each question in each section on the form, you will see a guidance button that you can click on, and this will bring up brief guidance on how to complete that particular question. This section of the application will cover driving positive impact and value for money. So as I mentioned, positive impact is broken down into five questions. First of all, you have to talk about your project's aims and objectives. You'll need to think about how your planned activities will contribute to achieving these aims and objectives. And the objectives should also tie in with the overall strategic aims of the Turing scheme, as well as those of your individual institution. In the next question, you will need to describe how your project will impact participants. This is the, the wider impacts outside of learning outcomes. And for example, this could be things like improved knowledge, developing new skills, improving employability, just, just to name a few examples. You'll need to consider the groups of students in your project and how you might see different types of impact for these. So, for example, you may have disadvantaged students who will be traveling abroad for the first time, and this would have a particular impact on things like exposure to a new culture. You should also explain how you're planning to verify and measure the impact upon participants. To do this, you can use systems such as SMART objectives, for example, where your project objectives are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time bound. The third question is about what kind of learning outcomes you expect particip participants to acquire. 
you should describe the expected outcomes of your proposed activities. And in the case of longer term activities, this should demonstrate how the extra duration represents value for money by the learners achieving a higher level or different outcome or skill. This question is where you will talk about how outcomes are verified and measured. I just want to note here, because we've been asked it quite a lot, uh, there's no requirement under Turin for formal recognition in the form of credits. You can use credits and you can talk about credits in this question, but you can also include other types of recognition here, including non-formal recognition. In the fourth question, you should describe what procedures you will put in place to continuously review your project's performance and the project activities. Evaluation should be an ongoing process and should be part of your project management processes to help establish baselines and highlight areas for improvement throughout the project. For example, you may want to take um, to carry out evaluation after the first set of international activities to see if any improvements can be made for your next activities that take place. The final question in this section asks how the project present, presents value for money for the taxpayer. Here you should detail any economic benefit that the project provides to both the organisation and the participants. This is the section where you should explain if and how Turin will open up new opportunities for you as an organisation and for the participants. This is the assessment criteria for positive impact. Um, I'm not going to read this word for word out on the slide as you can see it there, but you'll find it in full in the programme guide. I would strongly recommend that you review the assessment criteria for each section before you start writing, as it will show you what the assessors are looking for in a good answer. This section is worth 30 out of 100, and the headings you can see here are elaborated upon in the programme guide. Moving on to the next section now. So the next section is international engagement. This contains four questions, each with a 500 word limit. The overall aim of this section is to demonstrate the potential of your project in reaching new partners or enhancing existing partnerships. There are no priority countries under Turing, so this isn't factored into the scoring at all. And it's really for you to show why you've selected the countries that you have, and you will need to demonstrate how these choices fit with your strategies and also the aim of the Turing scheme to support the Global Britain objective. As I said, there are four questions under international engagement. The first question asks how the project will increase your international scope. You should talk about your international strategy here or any relevant policy at your institution and how your pro proposed activities will help you address your strategic aims. You should also evidence how the project's participants will share the knowledge and skills that they acquire through placements and what wider benefits this might bring to your organisation and the wider student body. The second question is where you should address what Turing does to enhance your existing partnerships, if you're, if you're using existing partners, that is, um, and or how it opens up new relationships for you across the world. You don't have to list organisations here, but if you can, you can include details of your partners if you think it's relevant or helpful to your narrative. In the next question, you can include benefit, details of the benefits that your partners bring to, to the partnership if this is known. I mean, for example, that could be perhaps you're targeting a specific partner because they lead in a field of a particular subject that you want to have students uh, to be mobile in. Whatever you write in this section, you have to clearly show why you've chosen the destination country and how activities in these countries will address your project's overall aims and objectives. The proposed activity should have greater potential value than similar training that could be offered in the UK and should contribute to increasing the international dimension of the applicant organisation. Throughout your answer, there should be a clear link between the Turing scheme objectives, the project objectives and the composition of the partnership. The final question in this section is on responsibility of the partners and how you will successfully engage with them to ensure the project's outcomes are met. This is where you should talk about the agreements that you'll have in place with partners. So we've had this question quite a few times already. So please remember there's no set Turing template for agreements. And so it's up to you to establish appropriate agreements with your partners. You should detail the process for that here and talk about any roles and responsibilities that you might assign to your partners. You should also include detail on how you will monitor the quality of your partnerships throughout the project to ensure that they're effective. And we'd also like to see detail on how you will communicate with your partners. Um, and by that, I mean how often, by what means, things like that, really.
The international engagement section is worth 20 out of 100. And again, I encourage you to read the assessment criteria in full before you write the answers. One thing I just want to add that came from yesterday's webinar on international engagement, you won't be penalised if you include countries that currently you can't travel to because of COVID-19 restrictions. So the example we had yesterday was Australia, for example. We would just look for evidence that you've provided, I would say, a reasonable time frame for activity to that country taken into consideration the current situation. Um, but you can include countries that you know at this very moment in time you can't travel to. You won't be penalised for that by the assessors. Before we go on to the final two main qualitative sections, I'll just pause there to see if we've got any questions on the first two sections or anything that we should clarify or go over before we move on. Thank you, Lara, and thank you everyone for your questions. I believe that we have so far answered all of them, uh, so we are sort of on track. None of your questions uh, related directly to the first uh, qualitative sections. Um, so there were more general uh, and let me just summarize some of uh, you were um, asking whether this webinar is going to be recorded and um, we confirmed that indeed it is recorded. Uh, there have been a couple of questions on the legal representative uh, section that uh, Sean, would you like to touch base on this? Yeah, sure. We understand there have been some um, technical issues with the legal uh, representative section. Uh, the technical team are aware of this and it should be resolved uh, very soon, hopefully in the next couple of days. Um, somebody has asked uh, whether um, you can include the general um, cost for COVID-19 testing uh, if needed under the exceptional cost. Um, so uh, yes, you can, uh, you can indeed. When it comes to other general questions that we uh, in relation uh, in relation to this that we received through uh, not only the webinars but also uh, also emails it is how you should position your application uh, in the middle of a pandemic and our advice is you know that you should bid actually um, as per normal uh, because should any flexibilities be uh, offered the department for education would offer this measure closer to uh, the project management date to the start of the project rather than now uh, because whatever you don't request at the uh, um, application stage, you cannot request further funding later on. So our uh, advice is to to bid as per normal. I think that's right. So I'd say, um, as we just mentioned there with you know things like Australia and the borders being closed, I think the thing is to bid for a best case scenario at the moment, and then you know, ad you know adaptations can be made if necessary later on. But because the funding can't be increased past award stage, really, you should be thinking of that best case scenario at the moment. Uh, there are a few questions that we receive and they uh, haven't been published as yet. <clears throat> as a follow up to uh, Bev's question and Sean's answer, can you reassure us please uh, that this will be decided and announced well before the 9th April deadline? Um, um, what would what be announced? Sorry, Simona. Uh, it, is, um, it is missing. Apologies, John. I thought uh, that you would remember. Well, no problem. If, who, who, who is the question from? I can look to see. Uh, there's a... Tom, uh, Tom Utterson, following on Bev's question. I'm publishing it just now. Um, oh, I'll follow uh, Bev's question. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, th this in terms of the assessment process um, and how funding is distributed, um, it, it isn't something we have any information on at the moment um, in terms of that being confirmed. I, I know that it will be confirmed at a later date. Um, but at this stage, for, for the purpose of this webinar, it's it's not something I'm able to comment on, unfortunately. Thank you. The next question. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, can the cost of tuition uh, be included in the budget for SENT and disadvantaged students? Sorry, the budget for what? Sorry. Uh, cost for tuition. I suppose tuition fees. Our tuition fees. Um, no, in, in the touring scheme, tuition fees um, couldn't be paid for. Um, that would include under those budgets as well. Thank you. Uh, can we confirm if there is flexibility in the funding between declared activities during the project duration? I'm not necessarily sure I understand the question when, uh, when it comes to flexibility in the funding between declared activities. Um, I suppose it is about what, uh, the difference uh, between uh, funding that you applied for and uh, would you actually uh, deliver on? Yeah, so we, we understand people will need to um, estimate a lot of kind of different aspects of, of their activity. Um, 
and ch changes will need to be made further down the line and we would offer, offer flexibility in that sense um because we understand you know not not everyone has their complete activity plan set in stone so we understand estimates will need to be made at this at uh, this stage um that m may need to be changed later so that's fine thank you Question from uh, Vanessa Johnson. Thank you, Vanessa. Will the legal representative still need to create an account and authorize the form through their account? The name is now correct on my version of the application. So does that mean that I can tick that box and authorize on her behalf with permission, obviously? No, so the, um, the process would be to share um, share the application with the legal rep for them to actually register an account. Um, We've actually we have had some feedback on that process and we've been we've been speaking to the technical um, team about um, sort of giving some clearer guidance on that. So the written guidance will be updated with with the steps on what to do with that. But um, for now, for the purposes of the guidance that's there, you can um, just refer to the share your application guidance in the written guide and you just follow that process for your legal representative then. Thank you. Uh, there is a question that we will um, we will sort of hover over in the next part, but I will read it out. Um, it is very difficult to estimate how many widening participation or send students will apply for the international mobility next academic year, and hence we are um, overestimating. How do we manage the balance uh, to balance this with value for money section justification, please? <clears throat> I think the best approach, is, I don't know, Lara, if you want to add later on, but I mean, I think the best approach in this sense would be to look at any kind of similar activities you may have arranged in the past. Um, perhaps looking at, um, you know, if there's any data that the institution already has on kinds of, dis, you know, numbers of disadvantaged uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, you can kind of maybe put your best estimate forward using the information that you have to hand. Lara, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to expand on that at all. No, I think that's fair. I mean, it is the first year of a new programme and the assessors are aware of that. So we're aware that things could change from your scenario that you outline now to the to the end of the project and there will be some flexibilities um, in the programme. So later down the line, there will be more information available on things like budget transfers. And you know, I think that maybe what the questions, some of the questions are getting at there is for how much you can move the money around when it's actually awarded. But yeah, in terms of winding participation, um, I think it's it's a Again, it's a best guess for now based on past performance, on you know, the evidence you have of students who are potentially could be mobile you know you've got groups of students that you think would, would be interested in the shorter activities for instance so you just have to base it for your institution on what seems reasonable at the moment um, but you no know, we understand that those those figures are a best guess for now I would say and um, I just want to come back to the tuition fee query sorry I know you've jumped a few questions since then but just to come back to that because I mentioned it in the last section and um, things like tuition fees there is no funding under Turin for that but when we talk about you setting up appropriate agreements with partners and um, tuition fee waivers can be a part of that. So that could be something to look at at your institution. If you're specifically interested in waiving the fees for a group of students, for instance, that would be at your discretion to arrange that with your partner. Sorry, Simona, I'll let you go. Thanks, Mara. We have only a couple of questions that I think we will be able to go through before we move on to the next part of your presentation. Uh, there is a question in regards to uh, the activities. Um, you have said repeatedly that individual higher education study placement may start before 1st September and end after 31st of August, um, if necessita necessitated by the partner semester dates. Does the same rule apply to work placements where dates are required to start and end outside of the, of the project dates? Yeah, so for the purpose, purposes of, a, of your application, it would be the same. So if a work placement started slightly before uh, the 1st of September this year or finished slightly after um, the end of August next year, um, for the purposes of your application, you would just enter the dates uh, from the 1st of September. So we wouldn't fund any activity outside of those dates. Um, mm -hmm. But whether they actually started in reality before or finished afterwards, that would be fine. You just need I to make sure that the, du the minimum duration is respected within that. So yeah, that's, it is fine, but just the, the duration that's funded by Turing needs to meet the minimum duration requirement. That's, that's a good point. And also the majority of the uh, the activity itself would need to be within the um, Turing funding window as well. Yeah, thank you both. Yeah. Uh, next one, can Turing funds be used to part fund a mobility with other funding sources used to cover remaining costs? 
I, I see no reason why not. Uh, this is this is a fairly standard practice um, around other funding streams. I think it depends on the funding stream. So you can't combine it with Erasmus Plus. Um, that much has been clear as far as I'm aware, Sean. And that's, um, but, um, no, that's, that, that is right. It, yeah. it would depend what the other funding is a contribution to. Yeah. Um, essentially, you can't use touring funding for anything that is already being funded. So it depends what aspect of, you know, this this certain activity that are being funded. So you, you would you would really need to take care in describing how the funding is contributing towards something completely separate. Uh, and a couple of questions actually on the uh, length of uh, the qualitative sections. Um, and we've got a perfect example here in uh, one uh, question. One question reads, there is a, um, a lot of duplicated requirements within the form. Uh, will the application be assessed uh, as a whole or will assessors score each section in isolation? 500 words is not enough to cover what uh, is, the requi what is required. And the second reads uh, the opposite, that they feel they might not actually uh, have 500 words to complete the section. Is that an issue? I can comment okay. on. Oh, go on. Sorry, oh, sorry, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, I think we're probably, it's something we'll get into later in the presentation, so perhaps we'll move back to the slides in a moment. But I think um, you can link the sections of the form. The, the, the assessors are given your application as, as a whole, so you can link to other sections, but just be, we'll cover this in more detail later, so I'll be brief now, but be very clear if you're doing that and be, sh and be absolutely sure that you're, you're linking back appropriately, because some of the questions may seem quite similar, but they do have a different angle on them. So one might ask you about participants where the other one is asking about your institution for example so you can like cross-reference the document if you want to just be really clear how we how you're doing it and so that the assessor can follow your logic um and i think yeah i don't know if you want to comment on the activity section Sean, and how potentially you can sort of do that there as well um thank yes, you yes what was what was the question on the activity section sorry simona um or was it I more to do with just a 500 say, word limit yeah yeah so um Essentially, yeah, if it, 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 it's a 500 word limit, we you know we don't expect everyone to write exactly 500 words. It's simply a guide. If you don't have, you know, it, it's up to you basically, and it's flexible. If you think you can demonstrate what you need to in, you know, using less narrative, then that's absolutely fine as well. Um, should, we, um, should we move back to the slides at that point? Because I think we're probably going to touch on some of that in the slides yeah, coming sure, up, and then we can sense. move back. Um, we'll probably still have at least 25 minutes for Q&A at the end, if that's OK, yeah. Simona, and then we can pick back up actually, on. I uh, actually gathered one directly uh, related to what you finished talking about. Oh, uh, go on. <laughs> by the partnerships. Yeah. How established do the partnerships need to be in order to apply, please? Could we make an application based, uh, based in a profile of partner institutions we are in discussions with that's fine so you don't need it, it can be it can be either established partners or it can be new partners and um, it's up to you really you, you know it's to say that it if you want to talk about existing partners what you'll need to do in the application is talk about how you're enhancing the partnership with curing funding so kind of what your your next steps are with them it's not just the same act Activity, you're able to enhance your activity with them by using this project and um, you can use new partners you don't need to have agreements in place at this very stage you know there'll be a commitment to that happening obviously later down the line if you're successful with your funding so it's fine if you're in if you're in conversations with people and you want to include them in your bid you just need to detail that in the form to say that this is who you're intending to work with and ideally i think you'd be you'd be looking at sort of giving a description of why you're sort of intending to work with those people as well if you haven't already so why, why why you're targeting those partners yeah, specifically definitely. thank you we can move on now thank you very much okay thank you for your question so we'll go on now to the the final two of the main as we say qualitative sections um, and then we'll go back to q a at the end so the next section we'll cover will be design of project plan which contains four questions and this section of the application will cover the design of the project plan and implementation and monitoring of mobility The first question in this section asks how you will manage the practical arrangements for mobility, including the management and support of mobility participants. This is where you should discuss the practical support put in place and how logistical arrangements will be made, for example, for travel. You should talk here about support before, during and after the placement. This is the question where you should address risk too, so you'll need to detail how you'll carry out risk assessments and what procedures will be put in place to mitigate any risks identified. It's really important to demonstrate the capacity of your organisation to manage a touring project, so please describe the administrative and financial structures that you have in place. 
you know, I, I know that many of you already have mobility projects and you can talk about existing procedures if appropriate, but just think about what you might need to adapt for Turin. The second question asks how you will monitor your performance. Now this could include how you'll measure progress, uh, what monitoring activities will take place and how often. Here you should detail things like what are your measures for progress? You know, how will you record this and how often? And who is responsible for monitoring performance? And how will you deal with any issues that are identified through this process? The third question is about preparation offered to participants. This will outline how you will help to prepare participants for mobility and should cover things such as linguistic support, technical preparation or cult cultural training, anything that's appropriate. You'll, you'll need to describe what support participants will receive in, in, in advance of their placement and who will deal with this in your organisation. Essentially, what we're looking for here is evidence that participants are as well prepared as possible so that they can get the most out of their placement. You should ensure that any preparation is relevant and appropriate to the learners course and also relevant to the target group of students. So something to think about would be if there might be particular preparation activities for learners with additional needs, for example, that you should consider. The final question asks how you will use learner feedback in future placements and projects. Similarly to other questions on review and performance, it is important that you demonstrate how you'll gather the feedback from participants and then how this data will be used as part of your continuous improvement processes. This should be built into your overall evaluation strategy and should be ongoing throughout the project. This is also where you should describe how you would monitor participants at later stages to monitor any long term impact from their placements. Um, for that could be something like it may be improved grades later on. The design of project plan section is worth 20 out of 100 in the assessment criteria. I'll leave that slide here just for a moment, but as I've mentioned before, this is in full in the programme guide. Each of the headings you can see here is elaborated upon and you can see what the assessors are looking for in the answers. We'll move on to the final section now, which is widening participation. This contains three questions. This section of the application covers how the project will effectively reach out to target groups to fewer opportunities and additional educational needs. As you probably know by now, reaching disadvantaged groups is a key focus of the Turing scheme. In the programme guide, you will find a detailed definition of disadvantage in the Turing scheme context, and this is in Annex A of the programme guide. I would recommend that you review this before you start working on the questions in this section. The first question here asks how your question, yeah, so your question, asks how your project will reach out to those with fewer opportunities or those with educational needs. Here you should outline your plans on how you will ensure opportunities are available for groups of learners who are currently underrepresented in mobility programmes. You should define any target groups that you've identified and why this is relevant to the goals of your project. You should link in how you've considered these groups when designing your project activities and talk about any particular challenges that you have at your organisation. For example, you could think about what has prevented these students from taking part in activity before and how will Turing help you reach them now? And that should be reflected in the design of your activities in this project. As I've mentioned, in Annex A of the programme guide, there is a definition of what we mean by disadvantaged groups, but we acknowledge that this is a broad term and you may identify participants at your institution that you strongly feel are disadvantaged, but don't meet that criteria. We would urge you to make this case clear in your institution's bid if you find that this is the case for you, um, as we will be able to allow some discretion where appropriate for the definition of disadvantage. And then would qualify for the top up. The second question in this section will ask how you how you promote and advertise opportunities and ensure that they reach as broad an audience as possible. You will need to give some information on your selection process and you will need to detail how this will be fair and transparent. You are responsible for deciding what criteria will be used during the selection stage so that the most appropriate individuals are chosen. For the participants from disadvantaged backgrounds, you should explain how your selection process would include appropriate provisions to mitigate any potential obstacles that they face in the process. The final question is where you should detail how you will support disadvantaged participants and those with additional educational needs whilst they're actually out on their placement abroad. Please give particular consideration to the additional requirements that students from these groups would have and how you would address them. 
for example, how will you ensure that accommodation is fully accessible for someone with a disability? You know, how will participants be supported whilst they're abroad? And is there someone that they can contact if something goes wrong? Additional support can be critical to ensuring that people from disadvantaged backgrounds get the full benefit from their international activities. It's therefore really important in this question that you demonstrate that organisations uh, working with people from these backgrounds are using extra resources to support them fully. Wine and participation is worth 30 out of 100 and is a key area for the Turing scheme, as we've mentioned before. I've mentioned right at the start that there are further two sections that do require a narrative and answer. They're not part of the forming qualitative questions, but we'll touch on them briefly here. So there are also narrative sections under activity and organisational support. So for each activity, you need to write a narrative for each month where the activity starts. You can see on the slide here, this is the guidance of the two sections. I've taken this from the form, so this will come up on the form where you click on guidance in either activity or organisational support section. The answers that you give for activities are assessed as part of the value for money criteria, so it's clear that you provide a strong rationale for your requested budget. I think as Sean mentioned in the Q&A that if you have multiple activities, it's OK to use bullet points in the narrative here or to refer back to where you've already detailed you know, uh, detail about that particular activity in a previous section. But please be clear which section you're referring to if you do this so that the assessor can clearly follow your your logic and your narrative. With organisational support, you just need to um, write a narrative about your proposed costs for um, for the budget. OK, so as we come towards the end of the presentation, I'd just like to go through a few general points to consider. You can copy and paste the questions into a Word document so that you can work on the narrative offline if you'd prefer, and that might be easy to work with others then as well. If you do this, just be mindful of the word count for when you copy uh, when you copy and paste your final answers into the form. So it's a 500 word limit on each individual question. Before you set out, please read the program guide thoroughly, understand in full the key strategic aims of Turing and how these can link to your own strategies and the work that you do. And um, throughout all your narrative and all your answers, you have to remember to link your project activities and your outcomes to the wider strategic aims um, of the whole project that you run, but also the wider strategic aims of Turing. So it's just to keep that in mind while you're writing the whole um, narrative section. If you can reach out to other departments and academic schools for information, um, this could be your widening access team, maybe, or perhaps you have a team who works specifically with students with additional needs, and they could perhaps help you with information that you need to target uh, those specific groups of students and could be really helpful for your bid. And finally, this sounds really obvious, but proofread really carefully, uh, particularly if you are doing, as we've mentioned, you know, referring back to other sections, just make sure that it all makes sense at the end. Um, it can be helpful to ask someone who isn't involved in the application so they have a fresh pair of eyes and can also ensure that your application makes sense to someone uh, that isn't involved in the day to day running of a project like this. And this can be really helpful to make sure that you haven't assumed knowledge anywhere because obviously the assessor won't know your institu institution inside out. So just make sure that it's really obvious to an external person reading this exactly what it is you can offer and what you're planning to do. We'll cover this next slide quite briefly. Um, this is just the application award process. This was covered last week, so I won't spend too long on it, but just to clarify, your application undergoes first an eligibility check. That's where we make sure that you are an eligible you know, an applicant organisation. And this is where I know some of you have been concerned about students applying. Well, they're not an eligible applicant, so this is where things like that would be ruled out. Um, it's then sent to an external expert for assessment. And this is where your qualitative questions will be assessed and a score provided out of a possible 100 points. A project assessment board will review a recommended list of projects to be funded based on application scores um, and results will be issued in July 2021. I know this is an awful lot of information, so please, if there's anything you want me to repeat or clarify, just please just pop it in the chat. I'm going to go over to Simona and Sean now to go through the questions. Um, we've left plenty of time for Q&A, so hopefully we can cover quite a lot of those now. Thanks, Simona. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. We received a couple of questions um, regarding the section that you uh, that you spoke about now, which is widening participation. Uh, the first question is uh, additional travel costs for widening participation students may be uh, incurred before 1st September. Can those costs be paid from Turin? Um, the, 
sorry, is that the, the exceptional cost of things like if they're covering a uh, passport and visa and things like that? Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure when the, the first payment date, I don't know if it, that can be amended for that particular budget category. Sean, I don't know if, if you can comment on that further, if it's one to take away. The earliest um, anything that would be paid would be August. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, if you're talking about an activity starting starting in August, um, you would enter that as starting in September <clears throat> as part of uh, mm. the application itself. However, for activities starting in September, according to how they're entered on the application form, you could receive funding in August for those. OK, that would be the idea. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, practical question. Uh, will the widening participation and send students be expected to provide all receipts for the exceptional cost? I mean, as a general rule, we would recommend that receipts are kept for, you know, for proof of all expenditure. Um, in terms of I know how that's arranged in terms of the um, the beneficiary sort of managing that with a participant, that would be completely at your discretion. But as a rule, we would um, we would recommend that receipts are generally kept. Yeah. Yes, uh, I would also add to this. Uh, obviously, in the grants management tool, uh, the way we will be reporting this will be uh, sort of um, explained in great detail a little bit later after the application stage. However, these costs are uh, actual costs rather than unit costs, so it is anticipated that you will need to keep those receipts in order to prove the 100% cost that you uh, incurred uh, in order to assist uh, widening participation and send students. Uh, and clarification question, if a w, uh, if a widening participation student goes to US in August, their travel won't be funded um, yeah, this is something that we just answered, uh, but I think we will also update the guidance accordingly as, uh, as these questions come, uh, you know, keep coming. Uh, will assessors have a, uh, have a background in higher education, mobility and widening participation in all these um, sections that, uh, that Lara just spoke to, or uh, do we just assume uh, sort of basic knowledge? No, we, um, I can confirm that the um, project approval boards, so the external boards who will be assessing the applications, they will all be um, experts within the relevant sector. Um, I don't have any inf uh, further information than that, but they, they will definitely have uh, expertise in the sector. I Thank think you. that's, um, I just thought, sorry, Simone, I would just add to that. I think that they do have a HE background um, and they would know, you know, obviously about the, the kind of challenges and the things that you deal with, but I think it's okay, just be careful and said not to assume knowledge or kind of use any acronyms that are not yeah. clearly explained just in case. Um, you know, they do have a good background in HE, but just they obviously might not know your individual institution. So just make sure that it is clear to somebody external. Thank you. Um, one question in regards to uh, the best estimate. Many uh, other applicants have asked us the, a similar question yesterday. Will we be penalised if we overestimate the amount of student mobilities? For example, uh, if we apply for 40 students but end up only sending 30 during the scheme, will this negatively impact uh, future applications or any no, other processes? I mean, we're we're giving the advice that people should give their best estimate. So, you know, we expect in some situations that, you know, participant numbers may need to be reduced and you wouldn't be penalised for that, no. Thank you. Next practical question. If we are sending students to the same country for both a full academic year and a semester, shall we put them in the same activity and calculate an average duration for this activity or should we have two different activities? That's a good question. Um, basically, provided that this these two mobilities, um, you're not planning to have disadvantaged participants, you can do that. If there are disadvantaged pass, uh, participants involved, um, that would sort of calculate an average would uh, negatively affect the disadvantage uplift. So provided that there are no uh, disadvantaged participants in those two mobilities you're referring to, um, and they're both the same um, mobility types, so that would be they're both uh, either study or work mobilities, then yes, you can calculate an average duration. Um, and I would imagine for a lot of people that might sort of reduce the um the administrative workload however if you know if you are starting to use uh, disadvantaged participants and including their information um please don't calculate an average because you'll end up with the wrong uh, disadvantage uplift amount thank you and apologies for for the noise we seem to have gardeners arrived cutting the uh, garden here um you mentioned that there is a flexibility with the activity duration is it possible to to, re to reduce it uh, but not extend. 
um, is that my correct understanding or is it also possible to change the activity start and move it back and forward? Uh, this is more related to project management and such flexibilities will definitely be possible as this is uh, in your application. You will just provide the best estimate, but uh, obviously you are not you can't be certain as to what exact days the mobilities will happen. So yes. Yeah, we will be we will be providing um, sort of more detailed information on kind of where that flexibility can be uh, applied. However, you know, with with participant numbers, you know, that 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 will be the case that you will be able to reduce them if um, obviously if, if there are fewer participants than uh, than originally estimated. Thank you. Next question. In reference to institutions being responsible for ensuring that participants are fully prepared before their mobility, is this also the case for the higher education sector, given that we are sending adults abroad? It, yeah, it, there would still be preparation in the HE sector. Um, you know, well, at the level of that is up to you as an institution as to what is appropriate. You know, I take the point, obviously, they are you're not sending uh, young people though to like, schools, but there would still be levels of preparation. So you may have placement. It depends on what you apply for. If you apply for something where they need to have a certain competency in a foreign language, then yeah, of course, you as an institution would have to make sure that that was the case before they travelled. Um, or, you know, there could be certain skills that they need. Or if you're dealing with particular you know, students from a disadvantaged background, perhaps, like I said, maybe haven't travelled before, there would be a level of maybe cultural preparation that would be appropriate yeah. there. You know, I, we can't sort of say exactly what you should put because I think really it's time for you to understand the needs of your student body and the need and the kind of activities that you've proposed um but they there certainly would be preparation appropriate for the he sector i suppose preparation is a broad spectrum isn't it i mean yeah I absolutely. People, people, people often perhaps assume that it might be referenced to something more kind of in the safeguarding world perhaps yeah but as lara said it could be a range of things from either cultural preparation linguistic it, it could be a number of things that obviously it, it would be down to you to see um what would be appropriate for you know for the potential participants yeah absolutely and it's it's down to you to define what that looks like at your institution you know i know a number of you existing mobility programs do pre-departure sessions and they do vary greatly from from each of you so i think it's just for you to think about your activities and what almost most appropriate there thank you can during funding be used to fund mobility programs offered by third party organizations such as international internship companies volunteering organizations and so forth Well, that leads us to the list of eligible uh, participating and um, um, receiving organisations. Yeah, um, I, I don't think it's discounted in the uh, in the ho eligible host organisations, but you'll be able to see if you just go to the programme guides, there is a detailed list of the types of eligible receiving organisations. Um, if it's not quite covered there, just just get in touch with us and we can look into that. Um, but just from um, just from your question, I don't think that would be discounted. So I think that would be fine. Thank you. There are there are a few questions about the funding itself, how the funding will be awarded, whether uh, successful projects um, that score higher will receive 100% of the funding, uh, or whether it will be um, somehow um, split between all successful projects. Yeah, th this is something I'm aware that the delivery team is still working um, through and, and looking to confirm as soon as possible. Um, unfortunately, I'm not, not in a position to comment as I, I, I don't know the answer as it hasn't been confirmed yet. So um, that is something that at this stage we can't comment on, I'm afraid. Um, there, these webinars are incredibly helpful. Thank you for this feedback, Tom. Uh, um, a question is, uh, can we access these videos again? Uh, if so, uh, where can we where can we find them? They should be up on um, the application video. It's on YouTube. It's not the exact one that went live last week. Um, we re recorded the slides for YouTube um, just because of sound quality, etc. So it is the content. It's just it may, maybe some of the questions and answers that I'm afraid. Um, but this session today will go live on YouTube in the next well, few days as well. So whenever we upload something like that additional resource, um, you'll find it updated on the application support resources page on Turin under HE, as well as application support. You'll now find a link to that. Um, the first kind of set of sorry, the first event that we did last week is now up on YouTube, so you can follow that video through to see how to fill out the application form. And this one will follow quite soon. 
We're also sending out the slides from last week and apologies for the delay with that. We were just waiting for the video to be live as well. So we'll be getting those out to you today. Um, and I guess we can send out the resources from today if, if they're helpful. But I mean, a lot of the slides from today, I would say really going back to the application guidance and the programme guide would be very helpful for you because that's where the bulk of the assessment criteria is and that's what you'll find most useful. Thank you. Next question, where can we find assessment criteria and, uh, and the way for each section of the application? I preempted that one. OK, let me find. I'll just get the programme guide open. <laughs> I can tell you exactly. Just give me one second. I'll just... um, so I will move on to the next question. Can higher education and FE vet students travel to the same provider on their separate programmes? Yeah, there'd be no rules against this. We, you know, if they they'd be put in a separate applications and they'd be assessed separately. Yeah, so that that wouldn't be taken into account. So that would be fine. Coming back to the assessment criteria, if you go to the programme guide um, it's on page 21, it starts and then it's after that. So it says qualitative criteria. You'll then find um, sort of a few tables really and they they, are, they have the headings of the sections. So wider participation, international engagement, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and you can see there the ratings of what they what they weighted as um, and you'll see three columns. So you'll have the heading of the section and then you'll have the headings that I've used on my slides. So and then you'll have next to it interpretation of award criteria. Um, that's the column. I think read that in detail. It's very helpful because it shows this is what the assessors will have in front of them. This is what they're looking for when they score you. Um, there is a repeated question. Apologies if we haven't answered this uh, before. Are we able to combine Turing funding with the Swiss SEM? program please providing that um the other program is funding something different to what touring funding is contributing to yeah that's fine they i mean okay. the participants can already be in receipt of other sorts of funding but just not it can't go towards the same activity thank you um is there a flexibility to change the amount of activities later on once the funding is awarded for for instance instead of sending students on long term there will be more students on short term mobilities i believe we have answered that uh, the flexibilities are quite natural uh, so this is the best estimate in your application um, and you, you will be uh, you will be managing uh, the funding that you will be awarded and uh, the goal is to spend it. Um, just, to, uh, just to follow up with my previous question with a practical example, if I want to send four students to Japan for a full academic year and two of them are widening participations, should I have two activities or can they be in the same activity? Uh, would it be better to break the participants group into different activities only uh, when it is the case of mobilities to the same country, but uh, of different durations? Yeah, so um, if the question is whether uh, WP participants should be included uh, in the average, record, record in the average, no, they shouldn't. Um, the, the, the duration would have to reflect the um, the actual duration for disadvantaged participants just so their disadvantage uplift is calculated correctly. Thank you. Uh, can we add any web links in the qualitative sections? The, do you mean on, on the form? Or? Yes, on the form in oh. uh, they are complete in the qualitative sections. They would like to reference link, uh, the link to the website. What, what we would advise is you can use hyperlinks to refer to very specific um, things. So, for example, if you wanted to demonstrate your uh, a specific part of your international strategy that's relevant for your project, that would be fine. We wouldn't recommend hyperlinking to kind of whole websites, whole policies. They would they would need to be kind of concise in pieces of information that you're referring to. And even if you're going to link through to the strategy, in theory, that's OK. But what the assessor doesn't want to have to do is go through like 120 pages of your strategy. So be specific if you're going to hyperlink to something that is like that. You need to say which part you're referring to within yeah, it. Yeah, highlight um, what's relevant. Yeah, absolutely. So um, something and this was true of previous program as well. Um, you can't use it to sort of for a huge chunk of content that didn't fit into your narrative, unfortunately. So you can you can use it to illustrate your point or to refer to something specific, as Sean has said, but it's you know just you need to be um, sort of careful how you use them. Thank you. Two practical questions in regards to the portal, whether the application has to be uh, shared with the uh, legal representative. 
or is there any work around it? Yeah, it would need to be shared with the legal representative or or someone working um, in terms of registering, or maybe someone work on behalf of a legal representative could register. Um, but the, the legal representative themselves would need to you know, have, have their own account and be able to access it. I think it would be fair to say on that as well, that we, we, we understand your feedback on that issue and we have passed it on, you know, for any kind of future iterations of the yes. form. Um, but at the moment, that is what we need to do with it. And the second practical question was, is there a feature to download an application uh, form to work on it offline? Not at present. It's something we we did ask the developer this was going to be possible. Unfortunately, I don't think it is going to be possible within this call. So again, it's something we fed back um, for future kind of iterations of the form, but I don't think it's something we can implement immediately, unfortunately. We'd um, recommend maybe putting your answers in on words to begin with to work hmm. on your drafts offline and then input the information when 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 you're ready and you're happy with it. That's perhaps a, a, um, an alternative that you can do for now to kind of serve the same purpose. Thank you. And the third uh, question on this is, are we able to attach supporting documentation to our application uh, if, in if we find it challenging to uh, fit within the 500 word limit? Uh, they would like to you know, further express um, or <coughs> Yeah. Um, that expand on the application by attaching documents. Yeah, I, I don't think that's a feature where you can upload uh, or attach additional documents. But as we said, you could you could use perhaps hyperlinks to very specific, concise bits of information. Um, but it wouldn't be a feature that you could upload uh, kind of additional bits to attach onto the to the narrative sections. No. Uh, can we save a copy of the application before we submit it? That's a good mm -hmm. question. Um, I we will take that away. I'm not sure. Uh, like, I'm not I, I sure. Do, I don't think. I think this is what we've raised before. If I'm honest with right. as a technical um, query to the support teams, I don't think we can answer that straight away. Um, but we can. Yeah, I don't, that think, up with them. I don't think it's currently a feature, but we have fed it back to the team. And I think the question that we will add to the list is whether the project plan will be accessible to the applicants during the assessment period, whether they will be able to revisit the application. Uh, although in, in a format that is not possible to uh, edit that's anymore. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, a good question. We can ask specifically if the project plan can be exported. I think that's something we can feed back to the developer, Sean, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. This is a question that we received also uh, via email earlier on. Um, um, I was surprised to see which countries were included in uh, group one list. Can you comment on this? And is there any scope for countries to be moved from group two to group one, for example, Norway and Iceland? I mean, these are set by the DFE. Um, I don't think there is any scope, unfortunately, to amend those. But I mean, we can we can provide that feedback to them. Thank you. Is it possible in the program guide to link the uh, section names on the form to the section names in the assessment criteria? It's quite tricky to work out which bit apply to which, as I don't think they are uh, they are in the same order. They are in a different order. I've just noticed that myself going into the program guide. They have got the same. Um, if you look at the section in blue on the table, they have got the same headings there. So you'll see international engagement widening participation, they will be the familiar names from the form. And right. um, above it, it's linking into like the higher objectives. So things like value for UK taxpayers, leveling up. So what it's tried to do is match them to the higher level objectives of the scheme. That in itself is helpful for you when you're writing, to be honest, to understand how these specific criteria link into what the Turing scheme as a whole is trying to do. Um, but yes, I have just noticed they're in a different impact to what they are on the form. So again, that's something we can, we can look at um, for a future version of the program guide, perhaps. But just if you're finding it confusing, I would just ma match it in with the with the heading you can see there in blue on the program guide. I'm pointing at my screen and none of you can see me, so I'm hoping you know what I mean. <laughs> but, th but that will match what is on the form. Thank you. Um, this is a little longer question. Can you clarify that you are anticipating or expecting multiple global opportunities in the project for existing unfunded and new activity covering all students, regardless of background, essentially hundreds of mobilities per institution 
or are you expecting a subset of participants to be submitted? I think that's completely down to you. I mean, if there are lots of different activities that you feel could fit within the broader aims and objectives of the project, then you know there, there isn't really a limit on the amount of kind of sub activities or mobilities that can take place uh, each starting month. Um, I think in terms of how you're looking at the project strategically, um, I mean, you may want to group a, a, a certain kind of um, a certain number of mobilities that really do fit in with that kind of that scope of the aims and objectives of the project um, and focus on a smaller amount. But like I said, you know, if 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 you've got a broad range of kinds of mobilities taking place and they all fit within that umbrella, those umbrella objectives, um, then, you know, we would recommend to include as much as you think is appropriate in that sense. So Mona, before you um, go to a, a few last queries, um, Matilda, can I just ask you to go on to the next slide, please? Um, because we've got, I just want you to have our contact details um, on this slide so you can see if you need to email us, um, for HE sec, do you email us at the British Council? And that's turin.scheme at britishcouncil.org. You'll see the links there as well to the website, which I'm sure you're familiar with by now, uh, the various social media channels. One, I um, just wanted to ask you all to make sure you're signed up to the Turin newsletter. I know there are a few teething problems with it at the start, but it is up and running. And um, please make sure you're signed up via our website. Turin has its own separate communication channels um, to Erasmus Plus, so you do need to be um, signed up to everything Turin related to get those updates. So please do so. Um, and any concerns, please email us at that address. Um, Thanks, Simona. Sorry, we've got time for a few last questions. I just wanted to leave that up on the screen. Yeah, I just wanted to announce also that I'm publishing uh, the feedback form and it would be really appreciated if you please could complete the feedback form related to this event. Thank you. We've got a few more minutes there. If there's any more questions, Simona or Sean. Um, to can you clarify that you are anticipating and expecting uh, if, if, apologies, I'm just reading the same question. I just skipped here. Uh, there was a question in regards to um, the groups uh, two and three um, uh, that we spoke about a group of mm -hmm. guns uh, previously and that uh, they are on the same rate, uh, group two and three. That what is what is the reason for having them uh, separately if they are? Um, let me just find it. Why do group two and three um, have the same rates? Why not to put them under one group then? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not quite sure what the answer is. We can take that away. Um, obviously, these have been set um, by the Department for Education. So these are, um, this is something that I can take away and try to get an answer for as soon as possible. That's a good question. Um, will more guidance be released on the process of certificate of expenditure and the process and the requirements of financial auditing. Does this need to be externally done? Or will there be uh, an expectation of uh, receipts from individual participants or just a requirement to prove funds that have been given to students? This is not clear in the programme guide. So um, two things there. So the certificate of expenditure, we have had a couple of questions on that. We're, um, we've gone back to try and get a bit more guidance, perhaps a couple of examples on what would be uh, acceptable um but in terms of um i think we touched on it earlier as well in terms of getting proof of expenditure we would recommend that receipts are kept for um for all manager of oh, all manner of uh, expenditure to do with your project thank you what does turing uh, cover for sense students specifically for example for those students with dyslexia or mental health conditions what could cost go towards this it well uh, for uh, special educational needs and disabilities, we would cover up to 100% of um, actual costs, uh, basically any anything, any costs incurred that are related to their needs. Um, so we would fund up to 100% of those. Thank you. Question related to the activities. If there are multiple departures in one month, for example, one summer school going to the USA, one going to China, uh, what would you recommend as essential to cover in the activity summary or should these be two separate activities despite departing in the same month? No, if they're departing in the same month, they would also they would always be part of the same activity. Um, presumably, if you know, if these mobilities are taking place, even though one's in the States and one is in China, I think you said, um, they're all part of the same project. So ideally, you'd be able to demonstrate that they they still they're in line with the overall projecting and objectives. Mm -hmm. 
and of course the organisations, uh, you know, own policies as well. Um, so ideally, you should still be able to demonstrate, even though they are in separate locations, um, you know, what the agenda is for both and how they both uh, how, how they both meet the overarching aims of the project. But they would they would have to be part of the the one activity. I think the way to look at that activity summary is it's a justification of what you've asked for in the section above, really, in terms of budget. Um, so yeah, Sean's right. You should you should be justifying why you've asked for those two different destinations, um, and you know what those even if it's the same activity taking place in two destinations, you would need to say why you've picked two different destinations for it to happen. You know, okay, in brief, but that's something you can talk about further in the other narrative sections as well, if necessary. But you should yeah. be it's it's basically it's a rationale. It's, it, these are the things we'd like to do, and this is why. It, for, I think for pretty much all of the narrative sections, you should be looked to justify any decisions you're making as part of your project. So that that also yeah, goes absolutely. to the location of the activities. Thank you. One more question on the certificate of expenditure, how to include it as a cost in the application form? Um, again, that's a very good question. We have gone back for more information on the uh, certificate of expenditure. So um, as soon as we have an answer, we will get in touch with everyone that's attended uh, this webinar and, and the other ones this week as well. But thanks for that question. That, that is a good one. And we are over time now, Simona. So maybe we just take one or two final questions and then wrap up. A couple of them uh, that is following uh, the activities, um, the comments on activities that you just provided, Sean. So the activities are related to the starting month rather than the destination country. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Yeah, that, that that's correct. So let's. Um, so, for example, you've got activities starting across February, March and April. Uh, you've got some starting in February, some starting in March, some in April. In that case, you would choose three activities. Your activity one would represent the one starting in February. Activity two would represent the one starting in March. Activity three would represent the one starting in April. So you can think of those activities as the starting months, if you like, mm. if that makes it easier. That might be useful to refer back to the video we've just published on from last week's webinar of them how to complete yeah. the form, because that will make that section quite clear. So if you any of you are finding that section a bit confusing, I'd recommend revisiting that YouTube video um, that's gone up. So like I said, you can find that on the website under um, application support under HE. A uh, question regarding uh, funding. Will Turing funds uh, students who study at an overseas partner after they graduate? For us, this applies to master students who can fit time overseas during their studies, so want to edit on afterwards. Yeah, that's absolutely fine, provided they graduated in the last 12 months. Um, graduates can also participate and that includes that includes master's students. Thank you. A couple of feedback. If we could uh, confirm that we make uh, assessors aware that many organisations will be submitting it, submitting the application at the end of March uh, due to the Easter break, so uh, in a shorter time. Um, also, um, we would hope to be able to see the application in the format that the assessors would see it. Okay. Um, we will. Is that OK? I think because we're coming up to five past eleven now, so I think we will have to wrap up there. Apologies if we haven't got to your question today that we have experienced a really high volume of questions in these webinars. I know everyone's very keen to ask questions and we completely understand that. But if we haven't got to you today, please just drop us an email so we can get back to you. Um, and, you know, there are some things we need to take away and get answers for, but we're doing our best to get those answers as quickly as possible. Um, just a reminder that all the guidance documents are available on the website. Um, the link is up on the screen for you there, but I'm sure you know it already. And there's the email address for questions. Um, and really just finally, thank you very much for your time today. Um, and we wish you the very best of luck with your applications. And just remember, we are here to help you if needed. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Good luck. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for your questions as well. They really help us to, um, you know, to feed into our FAQs and things like that. And like Lara said, any further support you need, if anything was unclear, don't hesitate to get in touch with us um, of the email address you can see on the screen. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks all.